Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you've gathered us, gathered us here this evening. We want to thank you that you've revealed yourself to us in Jesus. We pray you help us to have a better understanding of your power and your authority in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I used to know a guy who was so wild that hanging out with him was like hanging out with a tornado. Right? He was careless. He was reckless. He was dangerous. He was unpredictable. He was the kind of guy who your friends would kind of wait till he was out of the room and they'd come over to you and they'd be like, something's not right with that guy. Now, he comes to mind because he's a picture of the guy that we meet here in this passage. Except I must say, the fundamental difference is my mate was influenced by a whole host of things, but the guy that we meet in this passage was literally demon-possessed. Not just by one or two demons, but by a lesion of them. Now, we don't know exactly how many demons are in this guy, but in the Roman Empire, which is the empire that existed when Jesus was around, a lesion was a military term describing a detachment of 6,000 Roman soldiers. And so whatever the case may be, all we know is that this guy is a wreck, and it's any wonder he's still alive. He's self-harming, he's dangerous, he's hostile, and at this stage, I reckon there only seems to be one way out for this guy, and that was death. And the reason why I'm so confident about that is because my mate was nowhere near as bad as this guy, and yet about three years ago, while my mate was having breakfast, he had a massive heart attack, and he dropped dead. Now, on one level, it didn't really come as a surprise, because... My mate abused himself, and you can't abuse yourself as much as he did and expect to qualify for a senior's card. We knew that. But on another level, it did shock us because my mate was as strong as an ox. But anyway, my mate, as he abused himself, was nowhere near as bad as the guy that we meet here in this passage. This guy that we meet in this passage would have been like the walking dead. Now, at this stage in Mark's account of Jesus' life, we're in chapter 5, which means we're still relatively at the start of Mark's account here, and the disciples of Jesus are still trying to work out who this man is, who is this Jesus, and things are about to get a whole lot clearer for them as he comes face to face with this demoniac. Now, in the passage leading into the one that we're looking at today, you've got Jesus and his disciples on a boat. They're cruising across the Sea of Galilee. A big storm hits. The disciples freak out. Jesus gets up in the boat and he says to the wind and the waves, quiet, be still. And the whole storm just settles down. It was immediately calm. And his disciples were terrified and they asked each other, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And no sooner do they get relief from that storm that they keep sailing across the river and then they land on the shores of this pagan area outside of Israel called the Gerasenes. And this is where we pick up this story here in chapter 5 verse 1. This is what it says. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, A man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now, in our polite Australian Western culture, there's every chance that you've never met a demon-possessed person. Uh, We are kind of, there are people who are influenced by demons all over the place. Now, as far as being influenced by them goes, the Bible says that anyone who doesn't have a commitment to Jesus is influenced in one way or another. But we need to understand that what's happening to this man is on a completely, uh, on another level. Now, there was a movie that came out a few years ago that suggested that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And at least in the Western world, it seems like that is the case. Now, about two years ago, I was walking down the main street in Newtown and uh, there was this guy riding his push bike coming the opposite way and he had 666 taped to the front of his bike. 
And I thought to myself when I saw this guy, if this guy really thought that Satan was real, there's no way he would have taped that to the front of his bike. But you go to places like Mexico, Pakistan, Indonesia, anywhere in Africa, they'll kill you for getting around like that. And it's not because they're scared of you. It's because that they know that this stuff is real. Now, in the Roman Empire at this time, they knew this stuff was real. And in a pagan area like the Gerasenes, they knew what this was. They knew this man was possessed. Now, the guy in the story couldn't be bound with chains and iron shackles. Don't be too surprised about that. You talk to an Ambo who's had to try to restrain a guy on ice, and he'll tell you he's got the strength of 10 men. This guy's possessed by a legion of demons. I reckon the only reason his community didn't kill him was because they were fearful of where these demons would go if they lost their host, and he was tormented. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now, we don't know how this guy got himself into this position in the first place. We're not told that. But what we need to be careful of is opening the door up and letting these demonic influences into our lives. Because one thing's for sure, although God has control over these evil spirits so that they don't have free reign in this world, we do have the ability to open the door up and let them into our lives. Now, you might have seen or heard a movie made in 1973 called The Exorcist. It goes down as one of the most popular scary movies ever made. I don't recommend you watching it. It's uh, sick and twisted. But it's, what most people don't realize is that that movie was actually based on a true story. Not about a little girl. That just made it a little bit more freaky. But it was actually based on a story about a little boy who had an auntie who was a spiritualist. So she would have been the type to get around saying, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, one of them. And when this young boy expressed an interest in his auntie's ability to get in touch with spirits, she welcomed him in, she led him through this door and it was shut behind them both and the rest is history. And because this stuff is real, and more people play around with this kind of stuff than what we'd like to think, I just want to remind us all here of what God says about dealing with the occult. Now, this warning came from Moses about 1,400 years before Jesus came, and this is what he says. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire. I think we're safe on that one at the moment. Or who practices fortune-telling, or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium, or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. The nations you will dispossess listen to those who practice sorcery or fortune telling, but as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And the prophet that God raised up from among Israel was none less than Jesus himself. And what God is saying here is you need to make a choice whether you're going to listen to Jesus or whether you're going to listen to demons through whatever other mode of spiritualism people are into these days. But what God is saying here is choose very carefully. Because one will destroy you, the other has the power to save you. One will kill you, the other will set you free and give you new life. And as we read on, we see these two worlds clash as the Son of God comes face to face with the full force of demonic power. And you have to kind of imagine that behind Jesus would have been 12 men freaking out at the sight of a naked, scarred, demon-possessed dude rushing at them from the tombs. That's what's going on. This is what it says from verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. 
For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Now, if you were expecting some kind of a battle here, I can understand why this may seem like a bit of an anticlimax. Um, I don't know if you've seen this photo before. Uh, it's of Jesus arm wrestling Satan. I remember when this came out on the internet many years ago, it went viral. A lot of people loved it and they all sent it around because like the light versus the darkness. And what I want to say is this story that we're looking at here, it shows why that photo is so dumb. Because what you've got to understand is in reality, there is no battle going on between Jesus and the devil. Jesus is in full control. The battle that's going on, there is a battle. It's not between Jesus and the devil. The battle is that which exists between you and me. And it's a battle of our own minds as we try to decide on Monday morning and Friday night who we're going to follow and which voices we're going to obey. Now, the big question for the disciples at this point in Mark's gospel as they get to know Jesus was, who is this man? I'll tell you what I find interesting. As soon as these demons lock eyes on Jesus, they know exactly who he is. They cry out and say, Jesus, son of the most high God. And notice what they say. They beg him not to torture him. They beg him. I mean, these are desperate words. Now, what I find interesting about this little interaction is that the demons don't ask Jesus for mercy. I mean, you'd expect to see, I mean, these demons, they recognize who Jesus is, but they don't actually say sorry. They don't beg for mercy. They don't say, Lord, guilty, red-handed, we're sorry, we've sinned against heaven and against you. You can see we've done bad things to this guy. They don't do that, do they? Now, I'll tell you why, because these demons know something else about Jesus, and that is that he became a man in order to save mankind from their sins and not demons. All right, Jesus is our Savior. And this is why it's such a shame when people refuse to listen to Jesus when he holds out his hands and he says, come to me. Like one preacher once said, the gates of hell, they're locked from the inside. The people who are in there, they don't want to know God. And so they continue living under the shadow of death, just the way Satan likes it, trying to pretend as if their life makes any sense without Jesus. But now watch how Jesus takes this tortured soul and makes him a child of God. This is from verse 9. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Now, a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Now, if the first thing you think of here is, doesn't anybody care about the pigs? I want to say yes, we care about the pigs. And so does God. But know this, if every animal in the world had to die for the sake of one human life, it would be worth it. Because that is how much you mean to God as a human being made in the image of God. As someone made in the image of God, your soul will endure forever. The pig won't. And so Jesus is willing to sacrifice the lives of these pigs for the salvation of this man's soul. And as this cosmic scene is played out, word gets out, and the people come to see what had happened. This is what it says from verse 14. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man 
and told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but you know when people get scared, they often say things that they shouldn't say. And this is an example of that. They see this guy who has been possessed by a legion of demons and they know him and they see him now set free, sitting there, dressed and in his right mind and their reaction is fear. Now we see this and what do we think? This is magnificent, don't we? This guy has been literally brought back from the dead. The fact that he's got clothes on, praise the Lord. And we want to celebrate this kind of transformation. Now our vision as a church at MBM here is to see lives transformed through Jesus to the glory of God. And so we see that happening here and now in Rudy Hill Praise the Lord. When we see it happening in Jesus' day, we find it absolutely magnificent. Praise God that it happened to this man. And just while we're thinking about this man's transformation, let me just say something to you. If you're here and you're one of these people who have a sensitive conscience and you find it hard to believe that God would love you because you're not quite where you want to be in your Christian walk. If that's you, If you find it hard to believe why God would take you and adopt you and make you his own because you've got things in your life that you're struggling with, let me ask you, tell me what good did that demon-possessed man have to offer Jesus as an incentive for him to come into his life and to rescue him the way he did? Not a thing. And I'll tell you something. It was the very fact that he had nothing good to offer that made him the perfect candidate for God's mercy and his forgiveness. And I want to say the same thing to all of you here. If you try to present anything of yourself to God as a reason why he should accept you, maybe the fact that you missed out on the footy to come to church, which is a good thing, the fact that you're a good bloke, you've uh, lived at home with your mum for 30 years, helping her to do all the washing and the dishes and All that kind of stuff is all good, but when we come before the Lord, we come with nothing but our brokenness. And when you present nothing but your sin and your shame and you say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, he will rescue you every single time, just like he did with the man in this story. And the other thing to say is we need to see ourselves in this man. You need to understand, I am this demon-possessed man. Before I came to know Jesus, I was not in my right mind. I used to do things in my life that would harm myself. I used to harm people around me. I didn't care. I used to do things that were so shameful that I may as well have ran around the streets naked. And then I come to know Jesus. I lay it all at his feet. He transforms me. He dresses me in his righteousness He cleans my mind and sets me straight and he sits me down at the Lord's feet, ready to do his will. Now I want to say in one way or another, all of us should be able to associate with this man. But when we come to Jesus, he dresses us, he sits us straight and he sits us at his feet. But as we go back to the story, we're told that as these people saw this, they were afraid. Okay, probably in the same way that his disciples were afraid when they saw Jesus calming that storm. Now, there's another human trait that makes us scared of the unknown. Have you ever noticed how many people are scared of the dark? I'll tell you why people are scared of the dark, because you can't see what's out there. You don't know what's out there. But I'll tell you what's even more frightening, when you can actually see something that you can't make sense of. That's even more frightening because at that point, you can't just tell yourself that you've got a wild imagination. You've actually got to deal with the reality of what you've just seen. And these people in this story have just seen a guy turn up on their shores in a boat. And with no sign of a struggle or a weapon or anything like that, he has just taken control of a man who could not even be bound with chains and iron shackles. And not only has Jesus taken control of this guy and got him sitting down at his feet, but he has also taken control of the uncontrollable power that was in him. 
I hope you can see why these people were afraid. Our Jesus is frighteningly powerful. And the loss of the pigs would have just topped it off, which is a small price to pay, I would say, to have God turn up on your doorstep and save a tortured soul. Obviously not for everyone, and so they ask him to leave. But as they ask him to leave, this is where we get a picture to see just how incredible this man's transformation really was. This is what it says from verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed or demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And so the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Now I want to say, a genuine follower of Jesus, a genuine believer, will follow Jesus wherever he goes. Now in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus gives this vision to one of his apostles. And he says he gives him a vision of this large number of people who end up kind of putting their faith in Jesus and they end up in heaven. And there's an awesome little way that God describes them in chapter 14 of Revelation. And this is how God describes them. So these people that end up in heaven, this is how what he says about them. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. This is the way God describes these people who will end up in heaven. And I want to say, when I read that verse, if at the end of my life people can say that about me, that will be the single greatest achievement of my life. They can say he was a good man, he was a good father, he was a good husband, he knew how to live life to the max, whatever you want to say, all well and good, none of those things are going to get me into heaven. If people can say that about me at the end of my life, that'll be all that matters. Now, last week as we finished off the book of Isaiah, I don't know if you remember, we looked at the fact that God stands like this and he says, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient people. And the tragedy was that people weren't coming. This week, we see Jesus transform this guy's life and he begs to follow him wherever he goes. I think the question that we all need to be asking ourselves is, what are people going to say about you at the end of your life? Are people going to be talking about you saying, the type of person who saw the offer of God and just kind of made an excuse at every turn, dodged and weaved their whole lives and never really committed? Or at the end of your life, will people be able to say about you, gee, you know what, for all their faults, they followed Jesus, didn't they, wherever he went. Now this man in the story, they, he begged to go with Jesus. Because it's grand final day, I thought I'd put this in Australian lingo, just so that you'd understand how desperate this guy was to follow Jesus. You can imagine him saying, Lord, there are 13 men in a football team. You've only got 12. I'll play anywhere. Just let me come with you. And what does Jesus say? He says, you can't come with me, but you can follow me. And you'll do this as you go back to your hometown and you tell them all that I have done for you. And what happens? He goes and they're amazed. Now, they wouldn't have all believed in Jesus because of his testimony, because that's just the nature of things, but they were all amazed. And as hard as it is, to go back to your family and tell them about Jesus, I want to say we really encourage it. I think God encourages it. And we know that it's hard. But the question we've got to ask ourselves or the thing we've got to think is, if they're not going to hear it from you, we're living in a culture now where a lot of people don't know a genuine follower of Jesus. And so if they're not going to hear it from you, you've got to ask yourself, who are they going to hear it from? Take this privilege up. And go and tell your family. And on top of that, remember that Jesus comforts his disciples, you know. When he sends them back into their hometowns and he tells them, go and tell them the good news, he doesn't do that before he comforts them. And he says to them, when they reject you, 
just remember that they're not actually rejecting you, they're rejecting me. But when they reject me, just remember they're also rejecting the one who sent me. And so we understand that the cost of a witness comes at a cost, doesn't it? But the cost of not witnessing, it's even greater. And your testimony doesn't have to be wrapped in silk and coated with honey. It doesn't have to be anything special. You know what it needs to be? I have done all this bad stuff. Jesus has the power to forgive me, and he has. And he will do the same for you if you just get to know him. Now, as I finish up, I want to let you know that there are a list of about five people who are in heaven who I can't wait to meet when I get there. I'm going to track them down. I'm going to sit them down. I'm going to have a conversation with them. Now, the guy in this story, this demon-possessed man, he's in my top five. I can't wait to sit him down and have a chat with him. I can't wait to ask him what it was like for him to meet Jesus for the first time. Can't wait to ask him what it was like for his family, what their response was when they saw him again in his right mind, talking sense. I want to ask him whether those pig dudes ever became Christians, pig farmers, pig dudes. I grew up around pig farms. Um, but most of all, the thing I want to ask this guy, as I think about his commitment to Christ, I want to ask him what went through his mind, what he first thought when he realized for the first time that the only reason he was accepted back into his community was because Christ had to be rejected from his. I want to know what this guy first thought when he realized that the only reason he was able to be dressed and without shame was because Jesus chose to actually be stripped naked in his place. I want to know what this guy first thought when he realized for the first time that the only reason he could be in his right mind was because Jesus was to suffer the agony of hell in his place. And I want to know what this guy thought when he realized for the first time that the only reason he could have new life was because this Jesus chose to give his life up on the cross for his sin so that nothing would ever separate this guy from the love of God ever again. And I want to speak to him about this because what I find so impressive about this guy is that he gave his life up for Jesus and basically became a missionary before he even knew how far Jesus was going to go in order to save him. He recognizes Jesus as the Son of God and that was enough for him. He knew that that alone demanded his life. And as I think about that, I think to myself, gee, we are privileged, aren't we, to live this far after the cross? Because not only can we look at Jesus and recognize him as the Son of God, but we also have the pleasure or the gift of hindsight as we look back and see all that Jesus had to suffer in our place so that we can stand here today as forgiven, adopted children of God. And so what do we do about this? I reckon there's two things from this story that I want to do. The first thing that I want to do in response to what I read as I prepared this is firstly, it just encouraged me just to sit there at Jesus' feet and just be in awe at our Jesus, at his power and his authority in the world. There was no part of creation that he didn't rule. He's the boss, like the king of kings. That's why they call him that. He was in total control his whole life. That's the first thing it makes me want to do, just to sit there and meditate on the power and the wonder of our God. The second thing it makes me want to do is to go out and tell people about him. Because Jesus didn't just die for us here at MBM in Rudy Hill. Jesus died for the sin of the whole world. And there are many, there are so many people out there who would come if only they had someone to tell them the good news. This is a privilege to serve our God. And it is a privilege to tell others about his power and his love. 
Now let's pray and ask him that he would give us the grace to go from here and do just that. Heavenly Father, we just want to say you are awesome. You are powerful. You are frighteningly powerful, Lord. If you didn't make a way for us to have forgiveness, who could stand before you? Father, to think that you love us, that you care for us, that you sent your son to die for us, this is overwhelming, Lord. It is absolutely incredible. We can only pray, Lord, that as your people, you would help us to see who Jesus is, take hold of him and give him our lives so that we would be able to live for him, have the privilege of telling people about him, and have him shape every corner of our lives so that by the end of it, people will be able to say about us for all our faults, they followed the lamb wherever he went. What a privilege this would be. Father, I ask this for myself and I ask it for everyone else in this room. In Jesus' name, amen.